Hello, everyone, and welcome to our April Improving Lives Through Art virtual art tour, the final event of the MSAA Spring 2022 Improving Lives Through Art series. My name is Joe Kaliva, and I will once again be your host and tour guide this evening. Tonight, we are continuing to explore and learn about artists whose lives have been improved through their art and who continue to improve the lives of others through their work. All of tonight's guests are living with MS, like many of you watching tonight, and all of them are featured artists in the MSAA Art Showcase. Tonight's program will run about 90 minutes, and be sure to stay until the end, because after the interviews, some of the artists will be joining us for some discussion and to answer your questions live. But as always, before we officially get started, I'd like to hand the mic over to the president and CEO of MSAA, Ms. Gina Murdoch, to officially kick things off. Gina. Thank you so much for joining us for our final virtual tour of our Improving Lives Through Art Spring series. We cannot thank you enough for your support. My deepest thanks and appreciation to all of our art showcase artists being featured in tonight's program. Eileen Dillon, Bean Fairbanks, Shana Stern, and Maria Sammartino. And thank you as always to Joe for being our incredible host through all of our Improving Lives Through Art series. Truly, MSAA could not provide programs and services to meet the needs of the MS community without your help. So truly, thank you so much for your support. A special thanks to our sponsor, Publicis, for their continued and amazing support of this program and MSAA's mission. So I am excited to hear all the amazing work from our artists tonight. Back to you, Joe. Enjoy your evening. Thank you so much, Gina. And as always, before we get started tonight, I'd like to go over a couple things to make sure tonight's presentation is a pleasant experience for everyone. First, I'm sure you notice that your audio and video has been turned off. This is to reduce background noise and distractions. However, we do encourage you to post your questions for the artists using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And depending on time, I will ask your question at the end of the broadcast or possibly allow you to ask it yourself. You can also use the chat feature to communicate with everyone watching live tonight. For example, go ahead and type in the chat right now where you're tuning in from tonight, and we'll give you a shout out a little later. And finally, as always, I'd like to echo Gina's gratitude to our wonderful sponsor, Publicis Health, for not only making tonight's event possible, but the entire Improving Lives Through Art series as well. Thank you to Publicis Health for your ongoing support of MSAA. And now, let's meet the first of our four artists this evening, an abstract painter who just so happens to live and work in my hometown. Artist number one, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how long have you, you been an artist or how long have you been painting? Okay. So my name is Maria San Martino. I am um, from Philadelphia. I'm from South Philadelphia. Um, I've been an artist almost my whole life. My um, grandfather was an artist. My brother is an artist. My grandmother was an artist. My grandmother um, had one arm and she would knit and crochet and did all kinds of needlework. And that was her thing. And so, um, so we've been, so it was never like a thing where you just watch TV or, or just, you know, hung out and did nothing. You were always either painting or drawing or, or creating something. How old were you when you first discovered your artistic talent or the desire to pursue art more seriously? Well, I was, I first discovered I had an interest of art when I was about five or six, when my grandmother and grandfather would, you know, be creating things. And then they would, um, my grandfather would draw and then we would draw with him or paint and we would paint with him or 
color even. And my grandmother, um, when I was a little older, she taught me how to use um, needles, crochet needles, then moved on to needlepoint and things like that. So uh, all my life, my um, from from a young age. And then um, when I got diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, I couldn't do my job anymore. I was an ophthalmic technician for 27 years. Could you talk a little more about that? Uh, what led up to your diagnosis or what was happening that led you to get tested? So um, me being diagnosed with MS, um, how that happened was I was walking one day and I fell under the car. Like I was going, Alex, my wife was in the car and I went into a store and I came out and I fell and I literally couldn't get up. Oh, sorry. I didn't know I was going to get old. Anyway, I couldn't get up. So I got up. I was hitting the car. I'm like, <laughs> and um, I got up and got in the car and I said, I just fell. You know, that was just so weird. Like I couldn't get up. And so, um, so then um, we were, I was going to a writing group in Massachusetts, in Amherst with a very famous writer named Pat Snyder, who just died. She was wonderful. And um, I couldn't, at there, I couldn't feel my hands or my feet or my stomach got real tight and I couldn't feel anything on my body. And so um, on the way home, it felt like I was gonna have a heart attack. Like I thought my heart was gonna stop, but I couldn't feel anything. And so we went to the hospital and, um, they didn't know what I had, but they said, you know, you have to see a doctor right away. So on the way home, I called um, one of the ophthalmologists I was working with, and he got me into Thomas Jefferson University with Dr. Leist. And um, I went there. Well, he, I, wait, he ordered an MRI. I got an MRI and I went there and in one week I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. It takes people forever, right? It took me like one week. And that, that's what led me to being diagnosed with MS and then not being able to use my hands much or anything like that. So, and that comes and goes. How long ago was that when you first received your diagnosis? I was 40, how old, 58. I was 46, 46 or 47. I can't remember, but, um, and then I couldn't do my work anymore. So I had and I was writing a book at the time too. So I was writing a book about my best friend. It's titled The Frankie Files. So I'm just going to throw that in there. And, <laughs> and, uh, and so um, I couldn't do that. So I decided to then really devote myself to my art and just continue creating art and writing and um, painting is my thing, became my thing, you know. So it sounds like one door closes, but another opens. Uh, despite not being able to continue your work as an optomic technician uh, after your diagnosis, would you say that was what brought art back into your life? Um, being diagnosed with multiple sclerosis gave me the time I needed to create art. And so I was able to every day now paint and um you know, just get into my art more because before I was working a lot and um, then I couldn't, I didn't have the time, but now I have the time. And, and then I, and um, I have the energy to do it now. Then I was using my energy for working. Now I'm using my energy for creating. So I do it at my own pace and my own time because with MS, you know, you get a lot of fatigue and tired and things like that. So you were painting and doing art long before your diagnosis. Uh, did MS impact the way you approach your art or your creative process? Yeah, it didn't change anything of how I paint, but like I said, I got, I have, I can actually have the time to create now, but um, I wasn't painting for till like I was diagnosed with MS for a long time from when I was little, then I took a big break. I, you know, I, I would knit and crochet and, and do needlepoint things like that, but I wasn't doing any of that stuff, any painting. Right. In, in, and, and so when, um, you know, cause if we were taking a trip in the car, like driving to Provincetown, like I would knit a shawl. 
<laughs> that, well, I think shawls are wonderful works of art. Uh, and that's great to hear that MS didn't really impact the way you paint other than giving you more time to focus on it. Uh, how long after your diagnosis did you first become familiar with MSAA and the MSAA art showcase? Well, because I worked in um, medicine for so long, like I knew about MSAA. And so I looked it up when I was diagnosed with MS and I saw that they were having, so that was like 2009, maybe, I guess. And um, I saw that they have had the artist showcase and I, and I had, and so I just submitted my work and, you know, they, they took it and I was like, hey, that's cool, you know. And there's so uh, many good artists they have, you know, so I was really honored to, to be included in that. What's been the biggest benefit to you as an artist uh, featured in the art showcase? Oh, well, the artist showcase really benefits me in the way that I can get my art out there and, and have the world see it. And um, I hope that I inspire other people with multiple sclerosis because, you know, it's not an easy disease. It's a rough gig, you know, it's hard. And so, um, so that's how it really inspires me to be able to create and, and submit work. And I hope that like people who see it will, you know, say, hey, maybe I should pick up a brush. Maybe I should, you know, maybe draw or, or do something, you know. Because everybody right. can be an artist if they want to be, you know, people don't know that, but I know that. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. It's like yeah. writing. Everybody can write. You can, you know, if you sit down and you just put yourself to it and put your, put, put your heart into it, you can do it, you know? So it's important. Yeah. But that, that's, that's what I think for MSAA and they do so much good work for people. You know, they, if you need an MRI or a wheelchair or they do so much, you know, and I'm, I'm so happy that they do that, you know? Well, let's talk about some of your work that's featured in the MSAA Art Showcase. Uh, you were first featured in 2017, but I'd like to start with this painting from the 2019 Art Showcase titled Breakthrough. I love the colors you used in this piece, and it has such a serene and calming energy to it. Uh, your work is abstract, but this looks like a landscape to me, a color landscape. Could you tell us more about this piece and perhaps your inspiration behind it? Yeah. Um, I just felt like... Like I was, I don't know, like it just moved me, like the colors moved me and the, um, just like, okay, sometimes when I'm painting, I'll come up with, with the title. I don't always come up, like I don't do the title first and then the painting, but I just like put paint to canvas and then I'm like, oh, this is like breakthrough. This is like, this is what it feels like, you know, for people to break through something that they're going through. And, um, so I don't think I was going through anything, but I felt like, you know, this is how it feels kind of, you know, we've all been through things like my mother died and things like that. So um, yeah, the painting is um, blue and purple and has a little gold and yellow in it and the sun's coming through and it looks like it could be the ocean and it could be, there could be an island all the way in the background, you know, so um it looks like maybe you could swim out there and sit on that island, possibly. I mean, I, I am an abstract artist, so I don't usually paint things that people like. Usually, it like I can't put a, a a thing on it. You know what I mean? Like it is what it is, and it's like abstract, and it's and I love that. But this one, this one, like really felt like there was like a breakthrough of some kind. Like the sun was breaking through this the. the the, the, um, the island was like breaking through back there, you know? So that's what it felt to me. Well, from that same showcase, there's another piece titled Lucidity, uh, which I feel could almost be a companion piece to break through. Uh, the colors are much brighter and there feels like there's more motion in this painting, more energy. 
Uh, tell us about this painting. Lucidity to me feels like a dream. It feels like, um, like when you are like half asleep, but you're kind of still like dreaming and you're in that dream state of, and I have a painting dream state and you're in a dream state of, you know, um, waking up, but you still can remember your dream. That's what it feels like to me. There's like all this pink and blue. And it looks like there's also, there looks like there's an ocean in this. I don't only paint ocean, but this, I don't know why, but this one looks like there's an ocean in it and the sun's coming through, the sun's coming up. And um, there's some beautiful pink sky there that, that's, you know, when it's so pretty, right? When you see the pink in the sky, it's gorgeous. So yeah. that's what it looks like. The most remarkable thing to me about abstract art is hearing the different interpretations uh, by different viewers. One person might see an ocean, uh, but another might see a field of grass, or some might not see anything at all and just be moved by the energy of the colors and the way they interact on the canvas. Well, Maria, thank you for joining us tonight and sharing your work. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say in closing? Well, I'd just like to say to MSAA, thank you for all that you do for people with MS, like me and everybody else. And, you know, MS is hard. It's not easy. It's a rough gig, you know, and everybody out there who has multiple sclerosis, I know because it's not easy for you and it's not easy for me either, you know, so I get it. And um, just, you got to keep trying, just keep, you know, just try to keep moving. It's not easy to keep moving, but you got to just try really hard, you know? So, and everybody else pick up your brushes and paint. <laughs> <laughs> keep moving and just pick up your brushes and paint. Perfect advice. Thank you, Maria. And now let's head out West to the Rocky Mountain region of the U.S. and meet our second artist this evening. Artist number two, Tell us a little bit about yourself, and when did you start your artistic journey? Well, my name is Eileen Dillon, and I'm from Denver, Colorado, and I've been drawing since I was a little kid, but uh, raising family and all of that, I stopped for a while. So when I was forced to retire, then I picked my paintbrushes back up again. So You mentioned the drawing from a young age. Uh, was that always your favorite medium or did you experiment with other mediums as well? Well, the hint is I'm self-taught. So um, I did all kind of experimentation, but mainly uh, pencil, pen and ink, and I would try to paint without instructions. So that was really hard. But then later I started to learn more. Um, in my 20s, I started painting oils and later on um, just landed with acrylics mainly, but I still love to do pencil, pen and ink. Did you ever study art formally or attend an art school? Not really. Um, YouTube is very helpful <laughs> nowadays. <sighs> or, you know, my uh, I'd get hints from other people that had gone to art school and I'd ask questions and yeah, so it, right. it, it was definitely probably harder to not go to school and, and you know the school of hard knocks is hard knocks is for a reason you know yeah it certainly is a longer more arduous path to be self-taught uh, but many times it can lead to more creative freedom and experimentation as well eileen could you talk a little bit about your ms journey uh, when did it start and what led up to your diagnosis you know, Joe, that's a good point. What led up to the diagnosis was a lot of turmoil, a lot of emotional stress in my family. My son was born with heart condition. So that was always a deal and a divorce. And then my son needed a heart transplant when he was 14. Hmm. And, you know, people go through different things and um, they're trying to figure out what causes multiple sclerosis, you know, multiple scars. And um, life just hits you sometimes from all different directions. And I just couldn't handle it. And I realized that at one point when I was working, 
my legs were getting wobbly and I thought, oh, I need to go to a chiropractor. And she said, I think you have MS. And I said, no, I don't. You know, I kept trying to work and avoid the whole issue. So um, finally, when things came crashing down, you know, I just, I was a single parent raising three kids and lost my job. And my, right after my son's heart transplant, you know, and it's like, where do you go from there? But I had a strong church community. I had neighbors and friends, family that just helped me get through the initial shock of it and the, the denial, the depression or anger, you know, all of these emotions that we have to deal with when, you, you know, you feel like you're just perfectly healthy at one moment. And then what do you mean I'm this? Say, I, you know, this is not incurable. What are you talking about? You know, no, this is not me. This can't be happening to me. So after a few years, you know, of just um, trying to navigate through that without going into a deep hole, you know, you have to continually be positive. Like some of the things I would think I would, I would not say my MS because I would say, oh, then I take ownership of it. But, I, you know, I would, try to be more positive in my um not just in my own emotions but portraying to other people you know I want to be positive and upbeat there's something else I can do even if I can't walk very good I can do other things and art was that outlet how did MS impact or change your art or your creative process it changed and the process changed because of my brokenness and digging deeper into my heart and trying to find beauty in everything. And I would look at flowers longer, you know, and I would look at the sky at the sunset longer and go, I want, I want to express beauty in my art with some deep love and emotion that the the viewer could experience that. What has been the biggest change or challenge in your life due to MS? I think one of the changes too is um, the MS. I, I was diagnosed with progressive MS, which is the worst kind. So for me to be sitting here talking to you is a miracle after 15 years and it's mainly just affected my legs. And so my hands and my arms, it did affect my eyesight a little bit. And also I wanna bring up with art in your brain, I believe that just thinking through the process and being creative can heal parts of your brain as you go and your emotions. So it's a win-win for me. I, I, I thought, well, I'm not making any more money at a career, so maybe this could be a business for me also. You know, so I got pretty serious about it after that. That's so wonderful to hear. Uh, so many artists in the MS showcase, like you, Eileen, have these inspiring stories of turning their diagnosis and the new challenges that come with it into an opportunity to either explore their art more or create something beautiful to inspire others. Uh, how long after your diagnosis did you hear about or become involved with MSAA? Um, that's interesting because I got involved with MSAA four years ago, maybe just because I was looking for natural therapeutics, possibly. I'm not interested in the, the drug treatments and I'm doing fine without that. So um, I really like that sense of community and the sense of connection that they have and the positive kind of vibe you get from the MS Association. I really, I really do like them. <laughs> well, I completely agree. Uh, so do I. Uh, was it long after that when you first submitted to the art showcase? I, I don't remember exactly how long it was. And a friend said, you know, you need to enter that contest. And I'm going, no, I, you know. And then later I thought it wouldn't hurt and I might be able to be a blessing to somebody else, you know, just sharing my art. Well, let's talk about some of that art. I want to go back to the 2020 MSAA Art Showcase and start with this piece, 
titled Majesty. I think it is appropriately titled. Uh, it is certainly a majestic portrait. And of course, I'm a pencil and charcoal artist, so this has a lot of personal appeal to me. Uh, could you tell us the story behind this piece? Are you personally connected to horses in some way? I wish I was. Um, I, I did the Majesty horse because I just love horses. I just love, love, love horses. I can't ride anymore, but I didn't ride that much before, but I love, love horses. And I thought, this is just my personal experience. You know, when I think about Jesus coming back from heaven, it says he comes on a white horse back to the earth. I thought, wow, what would his horse look like? Perfect, right? Just majestic and muscular. And I was, um, when I shared that, pencil drawing. I, I did it over and over, by the way, because I wanted it to be, have a specific emotion, like the, the horse is bowing to the king of kings. So that, to me, that's Jesus's horse. And that's, it's my favorite of everything that I've done. Well, it's one of my favorites as well. And there are several portraits of animals that you did in that 2020 showcase. Are animal portraits something you do frequently? Yeah, one of my paintings uh, t entitled, I mean, titled uh, Chloe is my physical therapist dog. And I would, I just share my art everywhere. I take prints of my artwork and I have a little notebook and I share my prints with people. And my uh, physical therapist said, would you do my dog, you know? And she had a photograph. So I, I never met the dog, but I said, sure, I'll do that. And um she was so excited to take the picture home, show it to her husband. She showed it to the dog and the dog recognized herself in the painting. And that just made my day. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I thought it was, you know, when I wasn't really um, g good at doing animals, I'm, I keep trying and trying and, and that one I wanted to just be just right, you know? So it took me some time and so I was really encouraged when Chloe recognized herself. That was that. What else could, you know, what's better than that? Wow. Yeah. Getting the likeness of a subject is a portrait artist's greatest challenge. So if you can get a dog's likeness so perfect that she recognizes herself, that's quite an accomplishment. Uh, are there any other pieces from that showcase or a different year? that are special to you or have a personal significance? I would like to share a mini about each one. You know, to me, the line in the bush is just to be brave and strong and courageous, you know, and the, the painting has a lot of color in it, you know, a lot of intensity. And I did that on purpose, you know, to um, encourage people, be like a lion, be bold as a lion. And then the other one with the, uh, the meadow, that was actually from a dream I had. I just woke up and went, there's a mother with her child in a happy, happy meadow, whether it's in heaven or if it's on earth, I'm not sure where, but um, I actually had my caregiver pose for me to, to do that one. <laughs> you never know where you're going to find your next model. Uh, both of those pieces are lovely. Uh, but I have to ask Eileen, that painting behind you, uh, is that something we might see in a future art showcase? It's called The Secret Garden. Again, I imagined, you know, when uh, you're having trouble thinking straight and you have this MS symptoms, you want to go to a paradise spot, you know, your favorite spot. It might be in the mountains. It might be in the ocean, at the ocean. But I thought, what about a secret garden? So this is my secret garden. That. It's behind the fence, the big, you know, it's a surprise. You open the gate and there's the beautiful um, garden with the pond. And, and to the, my it sister a, wrote. It's on a book. Yeah, my sister published a, a book of poetry and she chose me to be the illustrator. So my secret garden is on the front of the book. It just came mm. out in May of this year. Ah, that's wonderful. Are there any other pieces included in the book besides the cover image? 
I had, uh, she did choose some existing paintings that I had. Excuse me. She did choose um, the lion in the bush. So I have to ask now, uh, do you have a favorite poem that you could possibly share from the book? Um, I that's thanks for asking about the poetry because my sister is very gifted at that and I can read uh, comments just a really short I would poem. love that of course okay so the title is come I looked up and saw my savior coming to me my eyes beheld the light of his glory my lips will tell of this never-ending story his gaze was as clear as a mountain stream my mind became lost as if in a dream. A brilliance from above shone through his heart of love. How could I describe his perfect face? It transcended all of time and space. The crown of jewels sat upon his head. His reflections touched my heart and darkness fled. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that, Eileen. So where can people find this book? So you can actually find the book on Amazon.com. It's called The Kingdom of Love. And um, there's my sister and myself on the back. Wonderful. Thank you, Eileen. And is there anything else you'd like to mention or say to the folks watching tonight? When a person has an incurable disease and they want to be creative and they want to be an artist, you know, to dig deep and into your heart and really every person is unique every person has something to express you know out of their hearts and that is still very valuable no matter what condition you're in you know we've heard of the uh, johnny erickson was paralyzed and painted with her mouth you know she did the paintbrush and so i just want to encourage other people that uh, whatever you're gifted at whatever you love to do go do it You'll be happier. You most certainly will. Thank you, Eileen. So let's continue our journey westward to the Pacific Northwest, where our next artist is located. Artist number three, tell us your name and a little about your beginnings as an artist. Hi, my name is Bean Fairbanks and I'm from Seattle, Washington. I've been living with MS since 1987. Uh, in my 20s and 30s, I was an artist. I was taking photos. I was doing textile arts and feeling really good about it. But as my MS progressed, my eyesight and my fingers lost in sensation. I couldn't do those skills anymore. And I got into a deep, deep, deep depression. And it was lasting for a couple of years, oh, maybe almost five. And I was telling my therapist, I have to, I have to find some art. I have to, these hands have, have to be doing something. So I discovered alcohol ink, which you can do without brushes. You can use cotton balls, straws, hair blow, uh, hair dryers. And in fact, uh, the picture right behind me, the green one, that's one of them done with a uh, blow dryer. Out of all the mediums that you tried or experimented with, did you have one in particular that was your favorite? Probably the one I really liked the best was textile arts. And I mean that from quilting to batik to silk painting to fashion design. Um, I really enjoyed the creativity with that. I really enjoyed working with the person that it was for and the kind of uh, together piece. And I, I enjoyed photography as well. It was a, there's another way of looking at the world. And with my photographs, I tried to convey what my world was looking like now. You already mentioned how your MS diagnosis impacted you personally and artistically. Could you talk a little bit about what happened prior to that? What led to you being tested and then ultimately diagnosed with MS? Um, I was early 20s, 22, 23. I, I know I was um, uh, diagnosed in 1987. I was still in college and a couple of things happened. One, I started stumbling around campus looking like I was drunk and people say, you know, you really can't drink during school. And I'm like, no, no. And 
I was in an advanced organic class, chemistry class, and that class is all about carbon, which is um, designated by a C. So here I am in this advanced class, and I asked the instructor, what are those C's on the board? What are those? Even though I'd actually taken three or four classes on the C before. And then the final thing was, um, after my third miscarriage, I was extremely depressed. And I was almost drove myself into an um, overpass but I didn't in the snow. And so next day I admitted myself to uh, the psychiatric union. But when they're doing my physical there, I was di well, preliminary diagnosed with MS. And that thought a lot of the depression, feeling that I'd been headaches and everything were all related to MS. That's a pretty significant impact that it had on you emotionally and personally. What were some of the first ways that it affected your art or your creative process? Um, for a few years, I could still do some photos if I could adjust them in Photoshop, um, but I couldn't take just raw photos. And as my MS progressed, my eyesight got worse and worse. I have blurry vision, I have double vision. And so when I try to draw a square, the lines don't match. They don't match. And with tremors, they're shaky. And so I really didn't think I would ever be able to do art again. And so that really put me in that deep depression I was talking about for a couple of years where I said, I, I, I have to, I have to. Um, and like I said, I experienced the alcohol ink and I had gotten some kudos for it. And that helped me build up my confidence to pick up a brush. But picking up a brush was a big deal for me because I really, in my head, didn't think I could do it. So I did a picture of a fish and the background is all kind of my regular alcohol ink stuff. But the fish itself is brushed in. The lines are crooked, they're wavy, it looks a little funky, but I did it. And they actually put that picture on the International Journal for MS Care in May of 1999. As I got more comfortable, I really wanted to get some instruction about brushes because I didn't know. And again, I'm asking, I said, there's gotta be some art therapy for people like me. There has to be. And I ran it around. And then I discovered an organization called Path with Art. And it is for people that have experienced trauma in their lives and are currently under case management. And under that program, you can take a different art class every quarter and a take-home art piece every quarter as well. So that was when I first did acrylic and surprised me again. This is my second acrylic painting. And Path of Art liked it so much, they put it on their notebooks. If you look at that, you can see the table is all out of whack. The, the wallpaper is off, the, the paving in the floor is. And I just had to start accepting that that was gonna be my style. And so instead of just being frustrated with what I can't do, I focused on what I could. And part of that is due to, I really think that art saved my life back then. And now it is a big piece of my physical, my emotional, and my cognitive therapy. And I don't want other people to be as depressed like that and trying to find art and they can't find it and they don't think they're going to be able to do it. So for the last two years, I've actually been working on like a manual with two parts. One is for art schools to make um, it more accessible for disability. And I'm not just talking universal design. I'm talking about through everything, the promotions, the um, activities, all of that, you can see people like you. And then the other part of the manual is kind of walking people through. So if you struggle with this disability, here are some art things I think you should try. Hmm. And you know, kind of guide them in a little bit. What a wonderful resource that would be to prospective art students who live with the challenges of a certain illness. 
And congratulations on those two wonderful accomplishments with being featured on the cover of the International Journal of MS Care and the notebook cover for Path with Art. Uh, Bean, when did you first hear about MSAA and what was your first experience with them? Oh, it would have been probably 10 to 12 years ago when I was trying to find some type of thing to cool me down and I applied and received um, a cooling vest. And then I know it's a long time because it started to wear out and they said, nope, got to wait another year. And so before I can get another one. So I'm on my second one right now from MSAA. And how long after that did you first become aware of the MSAA art showcase? So I received an email one November and saying, you know, okay, we're going to showcase uh, people that have MS and are doing art. And I hadn't been doing art at that point at that point really. So I was looking through all my stuff. Um, and so I searched through my stuff and put it in the showcase. So that was just kind of, I, I did it. I, I did, I took the jump. And then every year except one since then, I have done at least one or two pieces that are specifically for the art show. And then the other one may be uh, just to whatever, it's my women, Lindsay. Well, let's take a closer look at some of your pieces featured in the MSAA Art Showcase. And I'd like to start with this one from all the way back in the 2014 showcase titled Succulent, which looks to me like a painting, but it's actually one of your photographs. Could you talk a little bit about what led to creating this piece and how you got this painterly effect in the photograph? I used to work as a business manager on an organic farm. And part of my job was to help promote the farm. And so they bought me a camera and bought me some film. Then I took lots and lots of pictures of vegetables and fruit. And something the way the light was hitting that and just the way the leaves are going around, it looked succulent to me, you know, that it wasn't like a flimsy little lettuce. This something had body and movement to it. And I thought, wow, that's pretty fascinating. Maybe I could try to do something with that. And back then there's no way I would try to paint it. Um, and the photograph, photographs I took, you know, they're kind of fuzzy. I was, wasn't happy with them. The color is still good, but let's see. So I went into Photoshop and made all of the edges a little bit fuzzy. So you couldn't really tell where it was off. And that was my way of trying to fix that. I think that's another example of a happy accident. Uh, if some of the edges are fuzzy or blurred by mistake, blur all the edges. And now you have something wonderfully unique and creative. Now, if we jump forward to the 2017 Art Showcase, a piece which you already mentioned briefly, titled In the Deep, uh, which is a combination of alcohol, inks, and a brush painting. And before this painting, you weren't really using brushes, is that correct? I didn't even pick one up. Um, and I think I went like to Goodwill to get some cheap brushes because I didn't want to mess brushes up. I was really, really scared to do this. Um, and I had to kind of wait till I was having a good day. And when I got tired, I'd have to put it away until I had a good day again. But, you know, having that focus and trying to have my eyes and my hands work together, not just in a purely functional way, but in an artistic way. So it was, you know, I wasn't buttoning my shirt. I was making art. It was a really different sensation for me. That's another great example of the physical therapeutic benefits of art making. Now, I'd like to jump forward once again to the 2021 art showcase. Earlier, we saw a beautiful portrait of a lion in Eileen Dillon's showcase. But you also have a lion portrait in your showcase from 2021, titled Leo. I love when... Uh, we see these unexpected links or connections like this. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about this stunning portrait? I was in a park class and they wanted 
us to do an abstract version of an animal. And I was really mad. I was mad about all the things I couldn't do, that I wasn't interacting with people. And I'd been this person with wild red hair and out with everyone and dancing and, you know, eating whatever. And, you know, physically, I can't do those things. Physically, I don't look like those things. So in Leo, I wanted to put in all the energy that was still there, but I had to dig out and all the colors and variety in my life and dig those out so I could appreciate them. Because when I started that painting, I was not at a place where I could appreciate them. I was totally negative. But during the course of that, it really did. It really helped me pull those things out. And when you look at Maine, there's no straight lines in that, that Maine. Um, it was also very free and just like, <coughs> until I was, oh, okay. And it was really was that type of evolution. So this is a representation, I guess we could say, of your inner lion. Uh, a very different interpretation from what the lion represents to Eileen, which is always fascinating to hear these different interpretations and representations. Now, also in the 2021 showcase, you have this piece titled Geeky Artist, which really speaks to me since I can really identify with that title. Uh, is this a self-portrait or uh, is this something? It is. And I have a history of when somebody asks me to do a self-portrait, I do it really weird. So like the first one, it was green and shaped like a bean. It was had my head and my hair out. Um, and that's all you could see with my face. On it. And so this time when I was asked, I wanted to kind of experiment with cubism because I thought with that, I could also give myself the distance that I wanted. I felt like I needed. Um, I was feeling pretty vulnerable when I painted this. And actually, it's painted on top of another painting that I really was not happy with. So I let some of the purple stay and I sanded it in some places to kind of show that i had been beaten around a little bit. Yeah. Um, but if you look in the eyes and what's happening inside, there's still some energy. There's still some creation in there. Um, it just needs to help in bringing that out. Well, Bean, thank you for joining us tonight. Is there anything you'd like to say in closing about the MSAA Art Showcase or MS in general? So although it's not directly related to MS, there is a little higher incidence of heart attacks in people with MS. And I had my third one this spring. And... Um, I was told I probably wouldn't survive that. I wouldn't survive that. But I had a friend in one of the studios I'm in challenge me to do a painting about that. I'm going to move this just a little bit. So philodendron is kind of protecting the heart. And it kind of looks like a rib cage, kind of looks like that, but not necessarily. Now, this is all flat. This is what, I, what we call color blocking. It doesn't have any um, movement or depth to it. And part of that's been because I haven't been able to go back to this one for a while because I haven't been feeling well. And I think I need to be feeling better to really work on this, this life-saving leaf. And the other thing I would say is ask. Just keep asking for what you want. And if you keep asking long enough, you might find somebody who can meet those needs. Well said, Bean. So many of us really are afraid to ask for help, afraid to ask questions. But when you finally do, it's amazing to discover how many people are actually willing to help. Bean Fairbanks, thank you once again. And now for our fourth and final artist of the evening, still on the West Coast, but a little further south, and who has quite a unique and interesting painting technique and style. Artist number four, tell us your name and a little bit about this unique painting style. Um, hey, y'all. Um, my name is Shana Stern. I'm originally from Austin, Texas, but then I became um, a Los Angeles person for 20 years, went back to Austin for 10, and now I'm back in Los Angeles. So I don't know what to call myself where I came from, but that's my history. And um, I'm a finger paint artist. 
and I paint um, abstract pieces, um, mixed media, lots of different mediums and pigments and inks and oils all combined. Um, and I paint each piece to a single piece of music, um, which I can tell you more about later. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I do I do everything with my fingers. That's fantastic. Most of us joke that we could be great finger painters, but you actually do it and have transformed it into something very special. And of course, the marriage of painting and music is something unique and really near and dear to me as well. How long have you been painting? Did you discover art as a child? So I was a dancer, primarily. I, I started dancing at age three. Um, I did all kinds of dance. Um, I danced uh, up to 2013 when I had my first ankle surgery. Um, I was still dancing three to four hours a day, six days a week. So I, uh, music and dance was my happy place. It was my everything. And then professionally, I was a working screenwriter just prior to my diagnosis. Um, I edited, I um, ghost wrote some stuff. Um, so I was very artistic in those ways, but I was not an artist at all. But I, I was um, brought up with art because my father was an art collector. So, and then my mother also liked art, but very different kinds. But between the two houses, there was there was barely wall space in either house because there was so much art all over the place. So I grew up surrounded by it, but I never had the inkling to be an, uh, you know, a painter. Right. When did you first receive your MS diagnosis? And could you tell us a little about what had led up to that? Okay, so um, at the time, I was um, the assistant to an A-list director. Uh, we were working on a feature film. We were filming at the time um, in Arizona on location, doing night shoots. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a hard life doing that. It's 18-hour days, very demanding. Um, and all of a sudden, my right hand started to claw like kind of go in like that. And I thought that it was from walking his huge dog every day, or we did yoga every morning together. So I thought maybe I had like done something with the disc. So I, you know, I ignored it. I don't have time to deal with this hand. I've got all this, these responsibilities. And then over the next several weeks, the left hand started to claw. And then I got the, the standard, what's called the MS hug where my torso was like numb, but also feeling like it was being squeezed. And uh, I was very fortunate that the producers called UCLA and they said, we are sending this girl to you, figure out what's wrong and fix her, we need her back. And so I came back to Los Angeles. Um, and like I said, I was very fortunate to have these people like have connections and be demanding. And so I met with multiple doctors and finally somebody said, let's do a, a brain MRI. And I had plaques just littered in my brain. Um, and then they did a spinal tap, which is a, a horrific experience, um, but that confirmed the MS diagnosis. And after that, I know you moved back to Austin, Texas, uh, because you weren't really able to work in the film industry anymore at least in the same capacity as you did prior to your diagnosis. How long after that did you first hear about or become involved with MSAA? I don't know the exact year that, that I uh, knew about them. Um, I, I was told about them um, by Dr. Barbara Geiser, who was the head of MS at UCLA, um, because she said, oh, they have a lot of you know, they're, they're really focused on the person and the caregiver. And yes, there's fundraising, but that's not really like they are trying to better the lives of people with MS and caregivers of people with MS with all of these programs. And then when I did move to Austin in 2007, and like I said, it was the summer and the heat and humidity just were really affecting my MS. 
And I remembered, I was like, isn't there a cooling program something? And so I looked it up and sure enough, they had this amazing cooling program. And so I got um, a cooling vest, a neck thing that little ice packs went into, which I still have that I would tie around my neck or my head in dance class, and which enabled me to endure the heat of, of dancing. But uh, it really just that those things alone enabled me to do a lot of things, including dance, uh, which I wouldn't have been able to do. And so that's that's really how I, I was affected because of them and, and um, got to know them. And you said you weren't painting or doing art prior to your diagnosis. And afterward, you continued to have a creative outlet through dance and screenwriting. What led to your discovery of painting and specifically to the technique of painting with your fingers to music? So what happened was, is um, when I got to Texas in 2007, with all that heat and humidity, I also developed drop foot in my right foot. So it, it would drag, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't do the walk like this. It would kind of, I was walking, drag, walk, drag, walk, drag. And I was walking one day and um, just the drop foot caused me to trip and I tore my ankle. And so I was recovering from surgery and I was extraordinarily frustrated. I could not dance. I was no longer able to write because I was really having a lot of vision issues. Um, I was starting to have cognitive issues where brain fog would kick in. And that just doesn't work for a writer, um, any of those things. And I, I became like creatively constipated is what I would call it because I, I had no outlet. And one day I remember, I just remembered I bought my son the, all these cheap, you know, art products from Michael's and I literally crawled into his room um, and, and grabbed the paints and some canvas and sat there and started trying to paint. I, it was just, I, I wasn't doing it to music at the time. I just was, you know, just seeing if this would be something I could do that would feel good. And I, because I have no feeling at all in this arm and I'm right-handed, I just kept dropping the brush, dropping the brush. So, you know, I would drop it. It would like mess up the painting. I would lean over to pick up the bright paintbrush and sit up. And then I've like, my hair had brushed the canvas. So then I had paint on my hair and the canvas was messed up. And I, you know, I was like, this is not working. <laughs> Obviously I couldn't use, I knew I couldn't use a brush. I knew it was going to be my fingers. And so I just started, you know, painting and exploring and experimenting with my fingers. Not too long after, you know, I, I, while I was experimenting, I was listening to music because I don't like sitting in silence. And, um, and I, I have another, uh, issue it called synesthesia so i i see in my mind's eye colors moving um when i listen to music and because i was a dancer from so, for so long at a, at a young age um my kind of dancer brain started to manipulate it a bit what i was seeing in my mind's eye and 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 kind of see dances so i see like fully lit, costumed and choreographed dances when I listen to a song. What I try to do is interpret something about that dance, be it the emotion or the movement or something with the shapes, the costumes. Um, I just try to interpret something of what I'm seeing. It's almost like I'm, I'm dancing. I'm, you know, I'm using my fingers kind of to carry out the dance. Um, That's fascinating. Uh, a, a famous historic Russian artist named Vasily Kandinsky had synesthesia. Uh, he didn't know about this condition or phenomenon at the time. Uh, and when he started seeing colors to music, he thought he was having a spiritual experience. And color became a sort of obsession to him, which led him to become a pioneer of abstract art. So 
You are in good company there, Shana. But let's talk about your art. I'd like to start with this piece from the 2017 MSAA Art Showcase titled Sleep to Dream. Purple is one of my favorite colors. And the purples in this piece are so rich and vibrant. And the oranges complement and balance the purples so beautifully. Could you tell us a little more about this piece? Yeah, well, what, I, what I really love about that, that piece, but it also makes it like hard to sell online, is that, yes, it is. it has all these beautiful um, purples and oranges as contrast and some gold, but um, I used a lot of reflux pigment in it, which means that depending on the light that's hitting it and the position that you're in, it will shift to blues. So uh, like I did a video of it and it starts off and the camera reads it as blue. And then I, as I shift around it, all of a sudden it goes to purple. And, um, so, and that's one of the things that I love doing is using materials that either reflect light or shift and move depending on where you are in front of it um, and the type of light that's hitting it. Because to me, that's movement. And so it, with my dance, you know, part of what I'm trying to create is something about movement. So I love paintings like that, that, you know, do move and change depending on the angle that you're seeing it from. It almost seems like you are getting two paintings for the price of one, uh, depending on how the light is hitting it. And was this painted to a specific song? The purple and orange one, that is Sleep to Dream by Fiona Apple. Um, it's a really okay. sultry song, seductive, sultry song. Um, and with that one, it was like my, my current stuff, like what's behind me and the stuff that's in my studio now, um, is much more like you can tell it's much more about like the choreography or the shape of dancers bodies or like the piece behind me this is like the tr the trail that my feet would leave if i was wearing shoes that had paint that squirted out of them um as i do a waltz so um you know it's it's shifted a lot in terms of how i'm able to interpret it and that one was more about just the colors that would like were bubbling out through my brain as the different tones and the different sounds came out um well Another painting featured that same year in the showcase in 2017 is titled Devil's Backbone. It's a very sharp contrast uh, color-wise to Sleep to Dream, but also very different texturally. Uh, could you talk about this piece and the song that inspired it? Devil's Backbone um, by a group called Civil Wars. And so the white, like creamy parts that you're talking about um, was really thick. It was, it was so many layers of medium and, and pigment and inks, but it's, they're not actually white, most of them. They all, each kind of strip that, that you see of the white has a different interference color in it. So like one has some red, one has blue, one has green. It's just impossible to, to show it on a, on a still image. But in person, like I said, when you move right, you're like, oh, that's, you know, it, it's not like it's like blatantly showing up as red. You just kind of see a hint of shifting, you know, colors on it. And it wasn't um, an intent. It was one of those things that like used to happen to me in screenwriting where I would I would lay a part of a storyline down, but not ever really think about it again. But somehow at the end of the movie or at the end of the script, I had dealt with it like perfectly. And I was like, oh, that's a surprise. And the same thing happened with that in that once I took a step back from that section and looked at it, I was like, oh, that kind of looks like a really messed up, weird 
backbone and the song is devil's back so it was not at all intentional and that's just kind of what happened so that was one of those happy accidents um, yeah i love hearing how these happy accidents just cause these pieces to take on a life of their own shana I would like to look at one last piece of yours from the 2021 art showcase titled Time in a Bottle. Now, I know a song called Time in a Bottle. Am I right in assuming it's the song by Jim Croce? It's the Jim Croce song from 71 or 3. I can't remember. I've, I've, lately, in the past couple of years, I've done a ridiculous amount of pieces to 70 songs, uh, which is, you know, when I was a child. So I have certain associations with them but yeah with that one um that one I did very differently I there were so many tones um happening rapidly that I, it was impossible to to see any kind of an actual dance because it was literally like paint was raining raining down in these droplets um in my brain to to the chords, to the tones, to the music. And so um, with that one, what I did was I, I did lay down um, some really unusual textures, including these flakes that are very sharp, not thinking about the fact that I was gonna use my thumbs on this, but the whole thing is me twist, you know, sticking it in multiple colors at once, twisting it on, colors twisting colors twisting um so i built the the colors that you see that are you know, on the outskirts um that are more clear and then it eventually goes into this circle um it it's not white it's you know it's it's got pink and blues and all of these undertones and again colors that change as you get to this white center um, which was, which was when you're saying, when you were talking earlier about Kandinsky and the spirituality and what he saw, part of that was kind of like the, the, the greatness of the universe that was delivering, that I was seeing, you know, these delivering all this color and beauty into my brain with that all comes from the beauty and pureness of color and paint and painting and creativity into something just luminous, I guess, is what, my, what I was going for with that. Well, I would say you certainly achieved it, Shana. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. And thank you to all of tonight's artists, Maria Sammartino, Eileen Dillon, Bean Fairbanks, and of course, Shana Stern. Now, we are going to bring out uh, three of those four artists. Maria, Bean, and Shana are all here to join us live. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask those artists to unmute your cameras and your microphones uh, to get ready for some live discussion. And we will uh, bring them on in just a moment. Uh, before we do that, uh, I just wanted to mention uh, two things very quickly. Uh, first, uh, like I said earlier, this unfortunately is the final event of the 2022 uh, Spring Improving Lives Through Art series. Uh, but don't fret because the Improving Lives Through Art series will be back again in the fall. Uh, we have not... Uh, uh, scheduled any dates officially yet, but keep watching the website or follow MSAA on any of the social media platforms to stay up to date about when those dates will be announced. Cannot wait for the fall 2022 Improving Lives Through Art series. And don't forget this year, the big event, the Improving Lives Benefit 2022 there will actually be two of them, two ways to participate in the Improving Lives Benefit. There was a live in-person event in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on May 5th at the Barnes Foundation. 
and a virtual event on May 12th, the following week. And you might still be uh, one of the first 500 registrants for the virtual event. If you are one of the first 500 virtual registrants and you register by May 1st, uh, you will get a special gift uh, to, uh, to enjoy while you're watching the event. Uh, of course, if you missed the announcement, we are super excited to announce that Tyler Campbell will once again be returning to host both events. Uh, and the honorees for this year's Improving Lives Benefit are two amazing people who are very closely connected to the Improving Lives Through Art series. Uh, our very own Hannah Garrison is the 2022 Mission Honoree. And this year's corporate honoree is the CEO of Publicis Health, our wonderful sponsor for uh, the evening and for the entire Improving Lives Through Art series, Alexandra Von Plato. Uh, Han has been a part of uh, the ILTA series since it began, and Alex has been sponsoring the event since it began. So as I've said before, there couldn't be two more deserving recipients to be named this year's honorees. So congratulations to both of them. And uh, I hear our artists shuffling around in uh, the background here. So uh, we'll bring them out in just a second. As promised though, uh, we had a lot of comments in the beginning here of uh, where people were tuning in from. Uh, we just wanna to say to the artists, you had a, a national audience, people from across the country. Uh, New Jersey, always the most well-represented, myself in Woodbury, um, uh, Madison from Mullica Hill, Mullica Hill, Jen from Haddon Township, New Jersey, Gina, our president and fearless uh, CEO, uh, watching from the Jersey Shore this evening. Um, Tori and Merrill uh, are tuning in from NYC. Hope from Seattle. I have a feeling I know which hope that is. Uh, uh, Liz from Carmel, California. Vivian from Kirkland, Washington. And the lovely Ann Bishop from Atlanta, Georgia. I want to thank everybody. Oh, and Maria is uh, tuning in from Riverton, New Jersey. Our very own Maria San Martino. Um, uh, yes, Rebecca reminded me. How could I forget? I will be at the uh, Improving Lives <laughs> <laughs> Benefit uh, this year as well uh, at the live event uh, at, at the Barnes Foundation. And then if you're watching the virtual event, I will be more behind the scenes, but I will definitely be there. So uh, thanks for the reminder. Uh, dude. Okay, I'm going to remove my spotlight and uh, bring on all the artists. Welcome artists. Thank you for uh, joining us tonight. Maria Sammartino, Bean Fairbanks, and Shana Stern. Um, you know, it, it always lets the cat out of the bag when uh, we go live to see that uh, all the artists are wearing different clothing than they just were in the <laughs> interviews. Uh, those were previously recorded. So uh, how are all of you tonight? Great, thanks, Joe. Hi, Joe. Hey, um, hey, and thanks hi, for coming in. Um, I'd like to um, tell Bean that I was also on the International Journal of MS Care um, that you were on. Mm -hmm. And that's so <laughs> awesome. And that's because of, of um, MSAA, they found me through MSAA, and that that's that's something that happens through them. And then just recently through uh, Practical Neurology, they found me through. Um, they were looking for an artist with uh, MS, and they found me, and they said, "We like your art. Can we put it in our magazine?" And I said, "Yeah, go ahead." So, so I'd like to tell you that. So that was cool. <laughs> Maria, that's fantastic. Congratulations uh, on both of those. And um, uh, I forgot to put the image of the uh, of the painting that uh, was featured for for Bean. It was the um, uh, the painting in in the deep with the with the fish against the alcohol. I saw background. it. I saw that. I did oh, see really? It. Yeah. Yeah. It was there, Joe. They got to see all my yeah all my wiggly wiggly brush marks. Yeah, I love it. It's so good. Yeah, that's uh, wonderful. And uh, so, uh, yeah, we were uh, we were looking for a, a higher resolution image of the uh, of the cover for um, uh, the, when Bean was featured, but we weren't able to find uh, 
<laughs> one that appeared on screen correctly. So, but anyway, sure. I'm sure you can find it if uh, you do some searching. But um, so so great. So we do have some uh, some questions that came through for everyone, and uh, I will mention some of the. Um, uh, to anybody that's still watching, uh, instead of using the Q and A uh, feature right now, uh, you can you can probably go ahead and put them in the chat. Uh, we do have one for Bean uh, that came in uh, from Vivian. Uh, she says, uh, "Bean, earlier you showed an art piece with a beautiful dog. Uh, can you tell us about that beautiful Poochie?" <laughs> Actually. Was that Bean? I think she might be confusing it, it, you for. No, it, it was me. Um, it was the Path of Art Notebook. Painting. The notebook, that's right, yes. And so that was my very first acrylic class and I was terrified. And I, the final project was supposed to be an interior scene. Again, I had never done one. So to kind of help with my own anxiety, I did a picture of my service dog, Ayuga. And she's, well known oh, around in the art scene now um, that any art class, any art endeavor that um, she's with me. Um, she's what enables me to go out in, in public and to deal with my visual deficits so I can like focus on painting and not be worried I'm gonna knock somebody else's down or you know, run into somebody's table or, or whatever. She's, she's what allows me to be in the art world. And because she is part of the art world, um, the last Swedish MS clinic, MS art show actually had three paintings of Ayuga from three separate people. Um, so uh, she's an important dog to me and she's an important dog to the art world. Very, I was gonna say very, very important, uh, uh, a well-known uh, artist's model uh, in the art world uh, there she can, uh have an interesting side gig uh, going on. So, uh, and that's, and you know, the interesting connection too is the, and the reason why I thought about uh, Eileen, the painting Eileen Dillon had was uh, that was a service dog as well. Uh, so a lot of common threads uh, uh, here. Um, Shana, how are you doing uh, out there in California tonight? I'm doing great. Thank you. Yeah, I, it's it's great to see you, and um, I you know I have to mention uh, to you and to everybody watching that uh, the songs that you mentioned, uh, I originally wanted to kind of include them as you were talking about the paintings and and how they're in uh, how you create these pieces to the music. But um, since we post the recording of this event on YouTube. Uh, it, they don't like it too much when you use yeah. unlicensed music. <laughs> so, so I encourage everybody to look up the songs and, and check them out while you're watching uh, or looking at Shana's paintings. Um, but uh, Shana, you have a wonderful piece behind you. Uh, is this is this uh, something new? Oh, yes. This is, um, and I always say it wrong, which is shameful, but um, it's Bodhisattva Val, um, which is by the Beastie Boys. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's, uh, this very kind of trance, like very, very different Beastie Boys song. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's what this is like, uh, art from. So that was leading to a question. I think, uh, uh, someone came up with, um, uh, or someone asked a question about how you find titles for your work, uh, f for your paintings. Do you have an idea and you look for the song or when you start seeing colors to a specific piece of song, does that inspire the art? Um, I have a, I have a, what I call a paint list playlist. Um, it's about 640 songs long right now. Um, wow. And I mean, I paint from everything like hip hop, Americana, classical. Um, I'm listening to, I'm getting ready to start one. That's an Italian rock song. I've done French ballads. I'm, I've, I paint to pretty much everything except uh, country and Western. And that's not because I don't like it. It's just 
coming from Texas originally, I just see line dancing and two-stepping and that's, um, I don't know, it's just not as kind of emotional <laughs> and, um, as I like. Hard to portray on a canvas. Uh, yeah, it's a little, <laughs> a little more challenging, but um, yeah, it goes between um, kind of whatever mood I might be in and if I'm really in a bad mood, I actually, sometimes it's better for me to do something melancholy or something emotionally heavy or really hard hitting because I listen to the single song over and over and over hundreds of times while I'm doing a piece. So it kind of then allows me to expend that energy that I have in. Um, so it'll, it'll just go between, you know, if, or even sometimes I'll hear something brand new and I get obsessed with it. And if I'm listening to something 15 times a day for a week, I know that that need, you know, that might need to be what the next one is. So I just kind of go where the mood takes me. And, um, I watch a lot of dance videos, um, to get inspired as well. And sometimes that will remind me, oh, this song by this band or this album. And then I go revisit things. Very nice. And, you know, speaking of artistic backgrounds, uh, Maria, I love your background tonight. Um, it is so artistic. It's all of these reds. It's very fiery and passionate. Um, you have this great perspective uh, in the lines behind you, but yeah. the paintings above you, uh, we were talking a little bit earlier. Are you able to show them a little bit more on your camera? I can show you. So, um, so this one, okay, so here's what happened. So there was, this one is called Eaten Alive. And so there was a squirrel that was dead. I was probably hit by a car maybe outside of my house. And these turkey vultures, about five of them, came swooping down as I was painting and were eating the the squirrel. And oh. so, um, <laughs> so, so that's what was happening. And so um, that's why it's called Eating Alive because they were coming in and they were really, it was pretty crazy and it was pretty, you know, and so it was kind of sad and kind of like um, bizarre. And right. so that's what inspired this painting. <laughs> is the but you know that's supposed to happen i guess because that's the part of life that's you know happens that you yeah know, you don't want to happen but it does you know so, yeah so, it's so, yeah. <laughs> it's you know you never it, it honestly that to me is it's very interesting and inspiring because when I hear somebody say something like that, like they saw, you know, a, a squirrel being eaten, uh, like yeah. it, it, you never know where some, a moment of inspiration or uh, something is going to kick in creatively. Um, I mean, I so, uh, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and like I said earlier, that's what I love about abstract art is that, um, uh, you know, somebody, uh, I would not have interpreted that as um, a reaction uh, to that. Yeah, photo. No, you, I, I didn't expect it to happen. And it was just so um, like they and and they're so big. I don't know if you ever see, saw vulture. You probably have seen. We've all seen vultures, right? They're huge. Yeah. So there were like five of them. And they and there was one <laughs> that kept watching like for everybody else. Like it was like, you know, don't you come near this. This is ours. So it was watching. <laughs> Everybody, it was really um, like a behavioral study almost in that I've never seen anything, you know, so um, vivid like that, that they were, they were really in yeah. on their thing. They were doing their thing. The turkey vulture thing, it, it's surprising. They're, they're, uh, there's quite a lot of them uh, here in New Jersey. Um, <laughs> right. I, you know, but uh, there's, there's a lot of strange wildlife you wouldn't expect to see in basically a state full of suburbs but uh um, it's true. <laughs> but uh but interesting but i love those colors though maria it, it's amazing mm -hmm. uh you know the pieces earlier that we talked about uh those calming purples and some of those uh, uh color combinations that you use I, I definitely felt more tranquil uh serene uh yeah. i mean obviously the energy in that room it, it's a and i guess that's probably what i'm trying to say is just the, the energy that color creates um, it's remarkable when you see it like that. There's such a different energy behind you right now than was in those other paintings. Yeah, and my wife was like, I can't believe you're paying, you're hanging that in the dining room. It's, <laughs> this is for week five. She's like, you're gonna hang that? I'm like, yes. 
<laughs> so but we have guests. I just want them to eat and get out. I uh, just want, you know, uh, I mean, we don't want well, this tranquil. Well, it was just like, there was so much, you know, there was so much about it that, that they, I've, it, it was a lot. It was a lot to watch and, I, and I'm glad I did, but I was inspired by it and I was sad by it. And there was a lot of uh, um, emotion that happens, right? Like, because yeah. then I thought, like, I saw the, the squirrel's tail move and I'm like, oh my God, don't tell me it's still alive, you know? And oh God. Like, yeah, yeah, it was a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like well, you know, it, it's, uh, in the in the past couple ones of these art tours, uh, I tried to uh, program very different artists. Uh, it was just sort of by accident that I had two sort of abstract painters. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, tonight, um, uh, and even being, and even like there's uh, there's a lot of abstraction in your work as well. With um, like in the cubism, uh, the cubism experiments with geeky artists, which oh, uh, yeah. is behind you, and I have to just point that out. It's it's yeah. definitely my favorite uh, painting by Beam. Um, but it was interesting to see um, that, and the fact that it was all ladies tonight. It was it was sort of an unannounced ladies' night, I guess. But uh, uh, but your approach to abstract art, like all of you, is so different and unique. It's, um, I think it's one of the things I love most about uh, abstract art. Uh, yeah, and I'm honored to be involved in this, and thank you. Thank you. It's, very, it's, it's, oh, it's an honor to have you. It's so nice so to speaking have of that, when I was talking to Shana, um, uh, and this is one of the questions that came through, actually, was uh, who is your greatest inspiration? Um, I sort of mentioned Vasily Kandinsky, who, when it comes to abstract art, I can't do abstract art, um, which is one of the things I always say uh, when I'm giving tours at the barns, uh, you know, there's every once in a while, there's somebody that will look at an abstract piece uh, and say, oh, you know, anybody can do this, or my five-year-old <laughs> right. can do this. Yeah. And my first response is always, no, they can't. They, they can There's, <laughs> I can't, uh, right. I want to be able to do abstract art. Uh, but, uh, there's, there's so much more, uh, of, uh, thought process and skill and, and planning. Um, yeah. but, uh, but anyway, I, where I was going with the question was, uh, maybe, and this is a question for each of you, do you have, uh, somebody who, historic artists or uh, living or dead that uh, uh, is a, is your greatest inspiration and in, inspired your technique or who uh, you kind of always think of as uh, that was the artist who really inspired me to pursue this further. Um, Richter. 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 Yeah. Mine would be uh, Chagall. Uh, well, no, sorry. Yeah. Chagall. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Chagall, See, when I was young, it, it just, magnetic, mesmerizing, and addictive for me. Really. Yeah, Chagall, Chagall is beautiful. I, I would have thought that for sure that you would have said um, uh, Kandinsky since we kind of talked about yeah. uh, that. Uh, uh, he, he shared synest the synesthesia and, and kind of married color and music. Um, but yeah, uh, also well, thank you, Shane. Frankenthaler too, Helen Frankenthaler, yeah. Uh, um, uh, uh, Alma off Klimt is another one of my, um, favorite, uh, yeah. uh, uh, abstract artist pioneers. Uh, how about you, Bean? Well, for me, I've always been a big fan since I was 12 year old, 12 years old and looking at museums in, in Holland where have been the impressionists. But in the past two years, I've really learned a lot more about, um, Glinsky and have been studying his his book on composition and um some of my more recent alcohol ink and uh pen uh, art have often have often been referred to him as really uh being relevant to that to, have, to, to see that there's that inspiration from him mm. so it's really kind of evolved as my skill level has evolved and the different media uses um, that I've been experimenting with, because for me, it's so much of my cognitive therapy. Um, and so I'm always learning. I'm always experimenting with new different um, medias, new different types of art to really kind of keep that going. Yeah. Right. 
Very quick aside, I don't know if they're still here. Merrill and Tori have to sign off, so I just wanted to say good night to Merrill and Tori uh, if they're still on. Uh, but uh, you know, Tori is, um, I'm not sure how old Tori is, uh, 10-ish maybe? Uh, they're still here. They heard us. Okay. <laughs> Eight and a half, sorry. Uh, I'm going to make sure I put the, the half in there. Uh, Tori, thank you for staying up late. I know it's, it's probably a school night. Um uh, but uh, very interesting to hear about uh, the the inspirations, um, and also being you mentioned experimenting with different uh, media. Uh, that was another question that came through. I think all of you have t- touched on it in your um, interviews. But is there a favorite medium in particular? Uh, I know abstract art lends itself very well to experimentation, but is there one that you sort of always seem to kind of gravitate back to? Uh, Shane, I'll start with you. Um, probably different kinds of pigments, um, but I I kind of taught myself to become a chemist um, so that I could create a lot of the effects that I create. So I will take things that really shouldn't be mixed and mix them together and create mm-hmm. something unique. But yeah, pigments with with different mediums is is different. my favorite. Nice, interesting. How about you, Maria? Yeah, well, I I use acrylic paint because I don't really like um, I don't like oil paint because I don't like the smell of it and I don't like the cleaning of it. But I do have this product that you buy that you can mix it with acrylic paint and it makes it act like a um, a. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, I think I've heard act- about this. Yeah, and it's so good. It makes it act like an oil paint. It's like half and half. It's acrylic and oil. So I like that. And I use a lot of um, of gold leaf in my paintings. Like this is this is all gold leaf right here. So and here. So I, I use a lot of gold leaf in my paintings, and I, I love working with it. It's not easy, but I like working with it, and it's it's just yeah. a fun, it's a fun product to to work with. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's I another. Like- yeah, sorry. I was just going to say that's another thing that I really uh, I love about uh, uh, contemporary abstract painting is the mixed media uh, uh, pieces like that. Uh, so uh, yeah, you can just throw anything in there. Sometimes I use like um, <laughs> <laughs> anything. Like sometimes it's just like whatever's in my in my studio. I'll be like, oh yeah, I could use this, and and so um, it's just yeah, it's good. It's good. You can. Yeah, it just throw it in there. And that's yep. fun. Yeah, and it's fun, right? It's fun. Exactly. I, Bina, I have an idea of what you might, uh, what might be your favorite uh, medium, but uh, uh, how about you? What is uh, your current favorite medium to use? You know, actually, my current favorite may be watercolor right now, which I don't think I've. Nice. Well, actually, there is a watercolor on the 2002 wow. um, artist showcase, but I've been lucky enough to get. A different variety of scholarships which has really allowed me to play with different media i think the reason why the watercolor has intrigued me lately is because i can take classes for it and there are some ways that it's very much like the alcohol ink in terms of how much i can control and not control and for a control freak that that's really freeing um that i can't control every aspect of a watercolor or every aspect of alcohol ink but yeah, in the last two years, I have done pastels, uh, markers, uh, watercolor, colored pencils, acrylic, and done just about everything but oil. And again, for the health reasons, um, I'm staying away yeah. from that. Um, yeah. And also playing with, with the multimedia <laughs> piece. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, I, I, I had mentioned in the, in the chat, um, uh, during the interview is that uh, it, it, uh, every one of these virtual tours, I've, I've heard several artists mention alcohol inks. And uh, prior to this, I, I was not familiar with that at all. So um, it's certainly something I want to maybe experiment with. Uh, maybe I, I this gave summer. you a message, Joe, that I am happy to do that for you. And um, with talking with, with Jen, making that invitation open to others too. So mm-hmm. I'm hoping that maybe in next year's virtual tool and one of the teaching aspects, I can there introduce you go. alcohol ink to more, to more people. That's it really awesome. is an amazing medium. And the fact that you can interact with it with so many different ways and still get a very satisfying result. Um, I think it's a great doorway. Right. It's hard. Yeah. yeah. 
Oh, I hope that happens. And I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We're, we're well over the 90 minute mark here, but, uh, being it, we promised that w we will show this ingenious, uh, invention behind you. Um, I mentioned during your interview, I'm going to spotlight your video too. So, uh, if, if anybody's not, um, seeing you full screen here. So we noticed that there's a fishing pole behind your chair, but it's there's not for fishing. Pole that's behind my, my chair. And that's because I haven't been going out. It was originally put to my wheelchair so I could be going to art classes and participate in art classes. So the fishing pole gives me a lot of flexibility and it has the latex here done to my height and has a, a padded sling to support my wrist and my arm. And so otherwise it's way too tiring for me to try to hold my arm up this way, but this supports the weight of my arm and also assists with the tremors. So I can, not a very, I can make a smooth line. It won't be straight, That's but it can intense. be very smooth. Did you invent this? No, it was actually something I was working with my physical therapist and my occupational therapist at Evergreen Health. Wow. And I need to do this something, you guys, but I just, I don't have the arm strength yeah. to, to paint on an easel. An oh alcohol ink, I was flat, so I, I could do that. And they, even for that, I have a hand weight, so I can show you in a moment. But I couldn't do anything on an easel, be it drawing or painting. Yeah. But this allows me to, and actually I get much smoother marks because wow. it just moves so easily and flows so nicely. And I can paint practically quite a bit of time with this. Yeah. Whereas before, you know, 10 minutes max. Right. And the flexibility, it allows me, I can do big, broad strokes. So I can go in here and do these little eyelash pieces. So it gives me a lot of flexibility and really has just opened my world in wow. terms of, in terms of painting. I don't think I could have gotten the sense of confidence confidence and mastery with a brush without that. Yeah. And then I also use a hand weight mm -hmm. for uh, flat surfaces mm -hmm. because with my tremors on flat, I, yeah, yeah I, I, I still yeah. can't make the corners meet on my squares, but at least there's lines to my squares now, whereas I couldn't do that before. So that was part of my, you know, in the video thing, keep asking until you get an answer that can help you. And so it was me asking, you know, PT and OT, you know, saying this is really important to me. And I think it can really help my yeah. physical therapy and my mental therapy, my cognitive therapy, but I need help. How can you help me? Yeah. That's Alex really said in the chat impressive. that you need to patent this. Uh, yeah. I, it's so I know. impressive. Yeah, I think if you had if you had provided a link to go and buy that tonight, I think you would have had several orders. Uh, I, I was saying yeah. backstage before we officially started tonight that, um, I mean, I don't live with MS, uh, but as soon as I saw that, I want one because I'm just a big baby when I paint. Like you know, like because I'm you know, like when I'm working on something, I'm just like <laughs> my arm really hurts. Uh, but uh, I think that's just <laughs> such a fantastic invention. And, and the big thing is, it's so invention. inexpensive. There's so much about art that is expensive. I mean, yeah. I have to sell a lot of art to be able to make art, so I can afford the art materials. But <laughs> you know, they got the fish fishing pole at Goodwill. They had. Um, this is actually a OT and PT uh, tension bands that they used for this. And the OT used some scraps for her sewing bag to uh, make the actual sling part. Yeah, that's so, just- you know, really probably simple. everything was under 10 bucks. And yeah, and, and well, life I, I echo what you said about ask your PT and OT because I paint sitting on the floor bent over the canvas and I have a lot of injuries on top of the MS. And um, I, I, hurt my neck and I have two PTs right now working with um, materials to basically make me a body sling like mm -hmm. your hands yeah. so that I can literally be over wow. with my legs up and being able to just look straight down and work with my hands so I've got two of them they're really close to the feeling that they have and it will hang from the ceiling and I'll climb in it kind of like that. So mm -hmm. what you said is amazing advice for people um, to just 
get help from others thinking outside the box in ways so that your body can can create something yeah um, thank you that's and i'm excited for you you and your and your body slingshot i can just see that as being revolutionary for you it, uh, especially yeah. someone with long hair and it getting in the way of your paint oh yeah no that's that will be it will be pasted back i've lost a lot of hair to paint <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, uh, again, I, whenever I think of a quote, I can't think of who said it, uh, or maybe I just heard it from several sources, but um, a, a lot of artists will say uh, limitations inspire creativity. Um, I know there was a psychologist that uh, talked about the imagination being unleashed uh, through, you know, when you're constrained. So, um, but so... You know these these challenges they're not limiting somebody might see them as a limitation but it inspires all of either great inventions or uh you know these unique works of art so um artists thank you again for being here this evening wait 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 and, one more thing oh yes, yeah, yes i'm sorry to interrupt you but i want to interrupt you because when are we going to see your art oh <laughs> uh stay tuned uh okay. maybe uh maybe i'll do some sharing uh, i'm out to the you know when i start going to the uh to the uh the plastic club in philadelphia again maybe we'll uh we'll do some sharing uh, then uh great thank you maria and um i before we do sign off uh i'll i'll encourage all of you to uh, Put in the chat any place that you would like people to go follow you, uh, websites, uh, social media addresses. Uh, of course, those of you that are watching the recording, just go to mymsaa.org, click on the art showcase link and do a search for any one of these wonderful artists. And of course, don't forget about uh, Eileen Dillon, who couldn't be with us tonight, uh, yeah. who was also one of the featured uh, painters this evening. So... Uh, any last words before we officially sign off? Um, thank I'm you. Busy typing. Thank you. I'm busy so happy. typing. <laughs> yeah, I'm so happy to be included in this, and thank you for including me. I I appreciate it, and um, you all are such great artists. And thanks, I appreciate it. Mm. Yeah, this was a, a great night. Uh, wonderful paintings. Thank you to all of you for submitting. Uh, uh, be sure to uh, submit for the future showcases. Also want to thank uh, Madison. Uh, this was her, uh, you know, she's part of the uh, MSAA ILTA team. This was her first night. Thank you, Madison. Yes. Wonderful job. Uh, of course, Jen Gaynor, always doing a fantastic job. And everyone at uh, MSAA, uh, Rebecca Mooney, Gina Murdoch, of course. Thank you for making this possible. And of course, to close out the night, I want to thank again, uh, Alex Von Plato and Publicis Health for supporting these fantastic events. Thanks yes, again, ladies. Say, one thank thing, really quick, Joe, is that even if you just put your foot in 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 the puddle, go ahead. You know, I, I'm a scaredy cat artist. With, uh, yeah. Just, just try putting your, your foot in the well, puddle. It's. I, I actually feel anxiety when uh, when pe when you said watercolor. Like when I hear artists talk about watercolor or alcohol, like mm -hmm. anything that you can control. I mean, you know. I always just return to these my my pencils because I just feel like I can control well, the okay. line and I, but you know once I see things going on the canvas where I didn't intend for it to go I go ah so uh, all right Bean I will I will dip my toes into the uh, the virtual water. <laughs> Thank you again. All right, folks. Thanks Thank again for a guys. great nice evening. To meet you all. Thank nice you. To see you Joe, Stay yeah. Here, have a good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Bye -bye.